great. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Pam, for getting us uh, started here and situated. And welcome everybody to the August 18th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. All right. Um, great. Um, sorry, just trying to figure out my screen a bit better here. All right, whatever. Um, okay. Um, let me, um, we have an agenda for today, uh, most of which is going to be with regard to a focus on um, discussing the framework for what we want to do in terms of solar zoning in forest land, forested land, um, and then um, look at uh, updates that Chris has made on the bylaw. I wouldn't mind maybe if if it's available, Chris, and I don't know if you had time to get to that part, but to reflect back on any language you were able to write based on the last meeting's conversation on farmland. Um, so if that's if that's something we can um, look at, then we'll go to that after the forest land. Yeah, go ahead. May, Chris. I, may I say, yeah, um, I was able to um, incorporate in comments that I received on the bylaw as a whole, and I sent that out last yeah. night. I was not able to re uh, reconstruct um, what went on at last at the last meeting. Unfortunately, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to do that, but yeah. um, I'll, I will certainly have that for the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, no worries. Um, so much to do. And we did, I, I did de definitely receive the, um, uh, your um, version, updated version with all the comments and so forth. So we can, uh, we can start looking through that. Um, and I think that, uh, both in terms of how we want to procedurally sort of look and, and consider the comments that have been added uh, and, and so forth. Um, okay, uh, but the main thing will be to sort of get through the forest um, framework. Um, and but before we do that, and I think uh, before we do that, I it, it's my understanding that we don't have any minutes in this week's or meetings package to um, review and vote on. And so, um, let me just ask, it was Laura who took meetings, uh, minutes from the last meeting, which I think are going to be important for Chris to look at, um, in addition maybe to the recording, to, to um, so take capture what was discussed with regard to farmland. Um, and and uh, so those, those minutes will be important in terms of that. But have you heard anything, Chris, in terms of the minutes? Um, from last meeting, from Laura, I guess. I have not heard anything about the minutes. Um, Stephanie is usually the conduit yep. for all of those exactly. things, and and she didn't send me any minutes. Yeah. Okay. And and get to you in a second, Janet. Um, and then the other, I think we still have minutes to look at and review from the seven seven meeting, and who. That was you, Janet. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's why your hands up and you're muted. So I haven't I haven't had a chance to do that. I'm on because I was in my get rushed to going away. And so I'm actually going on vacation again next Thursday night. And so I'm gonna try to get them done early the week and get them to Stephanie and let her do her magic. So I apologize for that, but um they're they're on my mind. Yeah, okay, great. My, okay. List, my list. Okay, so um uh we'll try to catch up on minutes next time uh from two meetings ago one meeting ago and then for this meeting which brings me to the note taker <laughs> for today uh <laughs> which there's i assume that it's probably me <laughs> i think i was gonna get to that because uh yeah you're you're uh yeah when you're the you're the by no, default, you by haven't default. taken them since April. <laughs> I haven't. Well, April April twenty eighth was your last uh, your last go at it. So yeah, everybody else has done it since then. Um, that's available. Yes. So, okay, yes. so that'd be great, Martha. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. 
and um, I'm just gonna ignite you down for that. I have to say, it looks like Janet and I both chose our outfits today to go with our backgrounds. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Dwayne, you need a green. You need a green or a blue or actually, you're kind of matching your background too. I actually got a yellow shirt. Yeah, green and blue here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It's camouflage. I can't see you. Okay. Keep moving so I can see you. Okay. Um, all right. Super. Okay. So that um, then um, let me just see the formality of what else is on the agenda before we get into the bylaw. Um, we have uh, uh, staff updates. So other than the update that Stephanie is, is out, <laughs> um, any updates on your end, Chris, other than um, the bylaw stuff that we'll cover uh, shortly? Well, I just wanted to say that um, Janet and I managed to figure out um, the slope that Jonathan Edwards recommended for um, for solar in forested areas. And uh, it took us both to, and and also my husband to help us with that, but I think we figured it out. Um, Jonathan Edwards had recommended no steeper than eight degrees. And we figured that that was the same as 14%. So that is in line with what we have roughly in our bylaw. I think we have 15% in our bylaw. Mm -hmm. so, okay, perfect. And then, um, um... Yeah, I did see that in your notes, and I was trying to wrap my head around ge the geometry of that, but yep. um, and what the units are. I guess slope is not is generally done in percentage, which is what the slope is percent usually. So, but um, Jonathan Edwards um, made a statement in degrees. So I went to my husband and I said, "How do you trans? How do you transmit?" eight degrees yeah. into percent and he said oh you use the tangent and so he figured that out so oh yeah. go. <laughs> you know i i don't okay. haven't done trig for a long time but anyway yeah, exactly. um so we got that and also i wanted to say that i reached out to bill dwyer in hadley about um getting a copy of their bylaw that they're working on right now having to do with battery storage i thought that would be helpful and um, interesting to this group and i also reread um, the Belchertown and Hadley solar bylaws yesterday, and those are a lot shorter than ours. I think ours is up to 18 pages right now, and theirs are each are like four or five pages. So just keep that in mind <laughs> when we're adding things. <laughs> All right. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, yeah, brevity is always good unless there's a reason to go longer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Great. So um, how about any committee updates from uh, planning, Janet, or um, I can mention, I'm not sure if I have well, anything from ECAC, but. The planning board did get a draft of the solar bylaw at a meeting I did not attend. Okay. And so I think Chris could be, I haven't listened to that yet. And so I think Chris could give the update better than I could. Uh, yeah, so we walked them through the bylaw as it exists now and tried to um, explain where we are with it and the things that we're still um, that are still sticking points, namely farmland and forests. And um, they were pleased to receive that presentation, and they didn't really have too many comments. All right, all right, good. Um, okay. Um... I'll just for for ECAC, um, I'll just report that um, there is interest in ECAC um, and some initial discussions about potential efforts to um, try to outreach um, opportunities for solar on on the built environment. Um, um, and it, it's what's particularly of interest is the um, changing federal landscape. Uh, with regard to the IRA uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the ability, th this this um, provision there for direct payment in lieu of the investment tax credit for those that don't have tax liability. So it opens up um, a level playing field for solar ownership by uh, the, the municipal governments themselves, nonprofits, faith organizations, lower income people who don't pay as much tax, sufficient taxes, 
Um, and so uh, there's interest in ECAC and some discussions about how to launch an initiative to try to get that word out um, to app uh, appropriate entities within town, um, public and private, but but uh, you know nonprofits and so forth and faith-based organizations of, the, of this new opportunity and try to stimulate some interest there. Um, okay. Um, Wayne, do you yes, know Martha. how that uh, uh, would apply to our uh, academic institutions? Uh, well, it apply the same way. I mean, yeah, they they, yeah. they don't pay ta taxes. I know UMass doesn't, obviously. I don't think uh, right. the colleges do. Um, so yes, uh, it would, it would mean that, um, you know, they can, also, they can still do solar as Hampshire has and all, all of, all of us have academic institutions, but generally we don't own the assets, um, because uh, a third party okay. owns them so they can get the tax liability. Um, I see, but this um, would like be then in a way that, um, uh, say Amherst or, or Hampshire could, um, uh, if they wish decide to go in and actually own it and get the rebate. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the tax incentive, yeah, or, or what's called the direct payment. Yes. Yeah, and, yes. and, and, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. and, and, okay. yeah. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, and of course they have to come up with financing and capital and so yes. forth. Yeah, the same so. as any other private landowner, but, but yeah. since, you know, a lot of our land in Amherst is um, part of the colleges and university, you know, any additional, opportunity that helps encourage them is always good. Yep, okay. yep, for yep. sure. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, all right, any other uh, committee updates or anything along those lines before we get into the framework here? All right, good. Um, <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> um, let me, share screen um, where I'd like to start our conversation. Um, All right, good. So, um, what um, what I what I've done and 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 uh, sort of to to start the conversation, uh, similar to what we we did last meeting uh, on solar on farmland, um, as opposed to sort of digging straight into bylaw language, have a more of a framework <clears throat> of what we want to have. Um, in that in the bylaw um, pertaining to, to to now forest land um, and then and then um, Chris and her staff or Chris herself again um, take that uh, take the result of this discussion um, and start crafting language to um, uh, reflect the discussion um, I will say that given the that we just eked out a quorum, we may not, we may be in a position where we don't want to um, set anything in stone until we have a larger or larger group. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think we have a lot to work with and to discuss um, at this point to get, get us started. Um, and um, yeah, let me, uh, before we do that, let's uh, hear from Bob. And yeah, I just want to affirm what you just said, Wayne. I really would feel very uncomfortable specifying restrictions all these restrictions without somebody like Laura being present. I really respect her input and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, agreed. I, I think we we um for some of these important uh, issues and decisions uh, and recommendations, we want as a, a larger group and hopefully even even all of us. Um, go ahead, Janet. Um, I agree with the, what you're both saying in terms, but I think we could have a robust discussion and kind of talk oh, yeah. about issues um yeah um you know because it, it i wouldn't want to make like say oh we agree on this with so many people um not present i was wondering in addition to this um 
outline structure for discussion and Martha's um, ideas that if we could like kind of set up what we're talking about, like Amherst isn't covered with forests, right? And so we're really just talking about um, the area, like a certain area of Amherst, which, and I wonder if we could pull up the map, um, like the, the, the GIS, like you, we have those GIS maps and the Google maps and say, okay, this is the area. And then we could see where um, there's different overlays, like, you know, you know, there's, um, you know, what GZA is recommended, there's parts of this area are, you know, have natural heritage significance. There's, it looks like I'm, I'm looking at the, um, um, the town of Amherst zoning match, which map, which I have a huge thing is that a lot of water bodies in that um, feeding into other water bodies. So I just wondered if we could sort of get physically understand what we're talking about, because we're not really talking, we're not a town, you know, like many Western Mass or, or um, further West that are just really forested, you know, mostly forest. So are we just really talking about that corner of town, which I want to say is um, the northeast corner of town, you know, uh, back by Bridge Street and East Leverett Road or Leverett Road is, is that's our area. And I wonder if we could just look at it physically um, now that we have that capability. Um, but we also don't have Stephanie. So to help us through that process of, of getting that up on the screen. Um, I did, I mean, I, I did, as I was sort of putting together, you know, my thoughts as well, I, I did, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get back on it, but, um, you know, looked at the map, the GZA based map, um, you know, with the solar, um, siting criteria that we had GZA do that mapping. I'm, I'm less familiar with the broader GIS mapping for the town, but that one I was looking at. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of forest land, I mean, there's a fair amount of forest land in the south too, but that's kind of um, conserved or sloped. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but but yeah, so the the main um, area of of impact on this on these provisions are in the in the north. Um, and the, you're right, probably the northeast. Yeah. The GZA had two iterations, like the first criteria and then which eliminated so much. And then the second one, when they loosened or added, you know, loosened, I don't want to say loosened, but had fewer criteria, it added more, more possible sites. So yeah, I wasn't even focusing so much on where GZA was suggesting solar was feasible because um, I don't give that a a definitive weight uh, because it's the solar developers that will really figure that out uh, if they want. I was looking more in terms of, okay, what are the, um, what is the extent of this forest land? What, how much of this forest land also has prime soils? How much of this forest land is already conserved um, for various different reasons? Um, what is this forest land? Not that I'm a forester, but, you know, what does this forest land look in the context of the a swath of force um, that extend beyond, beyond Amherst's uh, limits, uh, and what what's the uh, extent of this forest as it pertains to the watersheds? That's sort of what I was looking at more so than you know what GZA exercise did in terms of solar feasibility. Well, I would say yes to all that. Plus, I think the GZA mapping was useful. So yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I wouldn't say it wasn't useful, but um, in terms of what I was focused on. Um, I guess, um, and I guess I was, you know, it is a relatively limited amount of town uh, uh, in terms of what's really at play here with regard to forested land. And I guess that's, you know, one thing we have to do is define what the applicability is. I guess I would, um, since I, I don't have, without some additional thought here. I don't know if I have access to that. Well, maybe you can do that next time. I so said, I don't want to yeah. take up meeting time if we can't do it. So I just, I just do think that we have a lot of facts and information at hand and it'd be good well, let's, to- Let's, as we discuss, let's think about, okay, what would be useful to explore on the map uh, to, to help us figure some of these things out. Okay, so good. Okay, so what I 
tried to do here and appreciate um, input, uh, Martha, your your input, um, and um, and then um, Bob, your your uh, comments from this morning. Um, what I try to do here is is uh, develop a, a a framework with really well first a strategy to start with a framework with with uh, minimal restrictions. Um, um, ones that we kind of, from what I've gleaned so far in our conversations are pretty, um, are, I think, relatively uh, agreed upon in terms of some consensus, uh, but much is not. Um, so start with fairly minimal uh, restrictions and then discuss uh, potential needs for additional restrictions uh, across several areas of concern and uh, sort of laid that out in a couple different areas of potential uh, uh, per reasons for restrictions, uh, and then add those restrictions if they're justified, um, and then design those restrictions accordingly. Um, so I wouldn't mind sort of having that discussion today. Um, let's not, let's, in my view, let's decide not to decide definitively uh, on any of this now, uh, today. Uh, until we have a larger group, uh, but let's have a robust conversation uh, that we can then um, summarize, uh, I guess, both in the minutes um, as well as um, to the to the uh, rest of the, the membership uh, once we're all back uh, together and hopefully have have um, um, full full attendance uh, or at least um, mainly everybody. Um, does that sound OK? Great. So, um, in the um, in the st the starting point, um, so just where we can start from. Um, and Jenna, why don't you put your hand down? I think uh, just so I know oh. when you put put it up again, because I'm sure it will go up again. <laughs> uh, um, just as a starting point, in terms of applicability, what are we talking about? Uh, in terms of this, this will be some section of the of the of the bylaw that is sort of special provisions with regard to solar siting in in force um and i think we're talking about applicability is um our general applicability uh for the whole bylaw which is um a 250 kw and above um ground mounted arrays uh so it's not for somebody who might put in a backyard 10, 50, maybe even 100 kilowatt system um, that might ha happen to be in in uh, in a forest area, but that's uh, for us to, to decide. Um, that requires clearing of trees on land designated as, um, you know, how do we know whether it's a for <laughs> whether it's a forest or not? So um, I'm not sure whether there is um, something better in the state or the town. Um, definitions already, but, you know, just looking at the GIS covers that um, we had available on the GZA mapping, there was this cover, uh, this um, uh, layer of um, a vegetative cover, uh, and then a category within that was trees. Uh, and so when I clicked that on, that seemed to cover um, forests. Uh, I don't know if that's um, the right definition um, or not, but that's sort of what I thought. So if there, if it's land that's that's in that vegetative area that is deemed to be covered with trees, then these potential restrictions or areas of restrictions would apply. Um, is that, uh, for those of you who know the town better, Chris, is that, is that, um, is that vegetate vegetation cover layer um, something we can sh that we should point to, and it's maintained and updated? Not not that the forest change a lot, but um, is that appropriate, or is there something better? I think that's reasonable for now. Um, okay. The last time the town um, mapped forests, I believe, was two thousand and nine. We do have a twenty nineteen flyover. But that has not yet been mapped. So, okay. you know, what we have in our GIS system is somewhat out of date, but it's not, as you said, you know, 
the area of forest doesn't change that much. And we haven't had that many big developments recently. So I think you can kind of count on what we have on our GIS as being representative of our area of forests. Okay. Okay, great. And when it's updated, um, this the, these will then be applicable to the updated layer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay. Um, okay, so then let's talk about um, sort of potential areas of restriction. And um, with um, some guidance that uh, Martha had put together in her structure, um, and then a little bit of working with that, came up with these three areas of restrictions, uh, one for ecosystem protection, uh, one for soil preservation, and one for um, view shed or, and, and water supply protection. Um, and so uh, let's look at each of these uh, separately first. Uh, for ecosystem protection, um, I've provided that um, as a starting point um, that um, for land that's designated as core habitat uh, on, on the MassGIS Biomap 3 uh, or priority habitat, um, as defined by the um, endangered, Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, that um, those would be areas that um, would be uh, disallowed for forest clearing for solar. Maybe they are. Maybe they already are for for uh, just generally. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, but um, that would be, um, I think, something that. We can discuss if that's appropriate as a, at least a starting point as a one restriction that we might uh, put into place. Um, yeah, uh, Bob. I think I think uh, Janet went first. Okay, sorry, I, I just go in the order of my. You know, I, I'd actually be interested in hearing what Bob says first. Oh, okay. Um, well. Yeah, I haven't dealt with either one of these, and I've been retired for 13 years, so I'm a little rusty. I'd be interested in knowing uh, what the state sets as minimum requirements. Um, I would suspect on the priority habitat, you know, it would be a prescription, no disturbance. The core habitat is actually looking at the maps from the state, and that pretty much defines forest land in Amherst. But, but I don't, I'm not as familiar with that, and I don't know what the state uh, prescriptions are for disturbance in those habitats. Yes, um, I did. Where did I? I did put. I did um, look at that on the Mass GIS. Um, and um, sorry, Dan. I mean, Robert, are you saying that um, priority habitats pretty much covers that whole forested area or oh, core? Uh, oh, I'm. Sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, I'm not used to speaking. Uh, the core, core. The, okay. the, the endangered species. That's where you know species where species have been identified and recorded as existing. The core. I'm not. It sounds like it's just large forest habitats in Massachusetts, and I understand the importance. But then it pretty much uh, defines all forest land. So, um, yeah, okay. I, I, that one I'd have to know more about. Okay. Yeah, why don't we, um, well, go ahead, Janet. Did you have something? Um, so so I, um, I'm glad Robert spoke first. I, you know, I, you know, looking at this section in the northeast corner that is mostly forested, I know that most of that was, um, in the open space recreation plan seen as an area for um, potential future protected lands. Um, I think they're currently um, zone residential. And so that obviously speaks to some importance of those lands. Um, and, um, you know, when I read the Nietzsche um, uh, solar assessment, they pretty much just, you know, basically eliminated all forested lands or anything over 3% slope. And so, 
you know, their assumption was that those lands aren't appropriate. Actually, they said it's, they're not appropriate for um, solar development. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think when I looked at this areas of restriction, I didn't realize the core habitat was so big, but I am concerned that, um, and I've talked to Scott Jackson at UMass, the professor there, it's like, you don't know what's there until you look at it. And so I think in, if we're gonna do ecosystem protection, um, we can't just look at what the current pri priority habitat is because that's what we know is there, but someone has to look to see what else is there. So if no one has looked at you know, 20 acres of the forest, we don't know what plants are there. We don't know what birds are there. We don't know what animals are there. And then it's also important when you look, because there was a development in my proposed in my neighborhood and you know, the wetlands and the wildlife, all that stuff was done in November and then redone in March. And wasn't very successful in terms of locating um, plants or animals or even wetlands. So those are my two cents. So I think we need to have the land, like whatever the site is, someone studying it and looking at it to see what's there. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I think that's really pretty unreasonable. Um, if we're gonna be scoring, uh, scouring 20 acres or whatever, looking, I mean, like Janet was alluding to, it, it is time dependent and there's so many listed species that um, I think we have to rely on the state who have already designated these habitats and just uh, kind of assume that, um, that this is essentially common Massachusetts forest and uh, people are out there looking all the time. I would think most of the endangered and threatened species have already been identified. And I, you know, I think we also it comes up in some other areas in terms of of um, restrictions that we're putting on solar that may not be applicable to other development um, uh, in 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 the forest. So I'd be curious if there's any requirements um, that such studies are done prior to to any other proposed development in in a forest. Not that there's been a whole lot, but All right. Um, okay, so I think that's one thing we can um, look at. It would be, and I did look at it, and I didn't, uh, and I don't have it in front of me, or I can't find it offhand. But I did, I did look at the Bio Three map, BioMap Three, uh, for the state GIS for the town of Amherst, and it didn't look like it was an. Ex covered all of the forest land there are bits of it but not not too much um, but we should double check on that martha yeah just just a quick comment on our previous point i mean maybe we could put a some kind of a size restriction say if the area proposed to be clear cut was greater than x number of acres then you required uh, a more of a of a survey for um you know, endangered species or whatever. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, Janet. So I, I think of all the kinds of lands in Amherst um, in terms of their importance um, for ecological services, I don't think you can find anything more important than um, wetlands or forest land. And so you know, we had this community survey and really strongly coming out to say protect the forest lands. Um, the eco services are just huge and they're they're part of the climate solution. And we're supposed the state is trying to increase forest cover and in increase sequestration. And so, you know, if I, you know, so the importance of these lands and they're most amongst the most important lands ecologically and in terms of sequestration and air and temperature modulation and wildlife corridors and you know everything you know the, the the our weather system to moderate droughts and you know excessive rain, rain floor it it provides it cleans water um drinking water for a lot of residents in the area so i i find this probably the highest priority lands to protect um fortunately our wetlands are protected fortunately in south amherst our drinking water supply is protected um, by state and our local um, wetlands laws. 
And so I, I think that the justification for solar on this are, you know, it's like nothing could have a greater impact than putting a solar array on forest, except for putting it in a wetland. And we're going to lose a lot of sequestration and a lot of damage in that process. And so I, I do think, you know, I, if I was going to pick land in Amherst where you can't have the solar large scale solar arrays, this would be the area. And it, it complies with state plans. It complies with hopefully the plan that we have. Um, and, you know, it, you don't, I love that, you know, I'm, I'm just, I think we need to look for endangered species. We have to protect all the species. And it helps us. All right, appreciate that. I think, you know, what we're trying to figure out is is the balance here. There's, uh, I think none of us would um, suggest that we, um, that it's not um, uh, no impact uh, on these issues um, by building solar in force, um, but it's a question, it, it's sort of in the context of the extent to which Amherst has preserved uh, forest land um, on behalf of the town uh, to, to date um, and other open space uh, and so forth. And um, uh, weighing all those benefits with the um, uh, need also uh, that the state has demonstrated uh, with regard to um, siting solar somewhere um, and um, and uh, uh, restrictions have to be very carefully weighed with regard to um, our need for solar development as well. Um, so that's where that's that's the issue. <laughs> uh, Bob. Yeah, you're a lot more polite about it than I am, Wayne. Every time people say, well, we can't build here, we can't build there, I want to hear where we are going to build. And the rooftops and parking lots just aren't going to cut the mustard. There just aren't any. This is Amherst. They precluded retail developments. There are no large flat roofs except at the university. There are no parking lots. Where are we going to put this solar we all want if we can't put it um, in working land or in forest land? I'm not saying clear cut this town. We have to be, we have to balance our restrictions. But we're encouraging to go, and I haven't heard much of that yet. Good. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, Janet. Robert, thank you for those direct remarks. There's nothing like a New Yorker appreciates more is someone just saying what they think. So I I agree with you. Is I mean I agree and disagree. So where I agree is we have to say where it should be. And so, yeah, it should be on college lands. Yeah, it should be on the university's parking lots and Amherst College and Hampshire College. Hampshire College has a brownfield. I agree with Jonathan. Um, I can't remember his last name now. Um, anyway, Thompson. John, what? Thompson. Thompson, thank you. Um, that we, you know, I think we have to give something up. And I'm actually agreeing with him that, yeah, maybe less on setbacks. So we see more solar day to day and we protect really core and important habitats. So um, I would give up, you know, like, you, you know, like I, if you, if you drive around town, there's a lot of open land that's just grass, you know, like, and so, you know, it's like a lovely grass entryway to Hampshire college, but it's huge. You know, um, we have a lot of farmland and grazing land and hay fields that could be dual use. Um, you know, the, our institutional, our, our educational institutions have, you know, an incredible amount of open space. They have the rooftops, they have the parking lots, um, you know, even in our village centers and downtown, there's lots of rooftop there that's not covered or, you know, our educate, our schools don't have any, I don't even think there's a single municipal building with a solar panel on it, but I may be wrong. So I think we go there first, we go to university drive, we go to the big Y, and the state has said we have like, what is it, 15 to 18 times the amount of developed properties that could take the solar that we need. And so I'm willing to relent on setbacks, open up more day-to-day -day lands. But I really do think, you know, these, these forest lands are really, it's, you know, that's, they are so important to our ecology and our environment and it's important to sequestration. It's part of our climate strategy of our state is to increase these lands because, you know, we need to increase 
you know, sequestration up to 15% of, you know, carbon, whatever. So, I mean, Martha's better on this, but if that's the goal, why are we cutting lands? You know, we're watching forests throughout the, you know, North America burn. So let's cut some more because we don't want to put it on our high school roof. You know, I, I would rather have a solar array across the street from me or, you know, a dual use facility behind me than to see the forest cut. And that's what the town thinks. You know, those are the community values of our town. All right, I just want to be careful not to be careful in terms of, I wouldn't say false equivalencies, but, you know, a, 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 a project on the high school roof is not equivalent to, you know, a hundred kilowatt project on a high school roof is not equivalent to two megawatts on open land somewhere. It would take 20 schools to make make up that. Uh, so, um, you know, it's not, these are not sub necessary substitutes for each other. Uh, so I want to keep that in mind in, as we discuss this. Um, and also, um, there are the, the, the rate at which we need to build out our renewable energy supply um, has to be kept in mind as well. Uh, and the um, markets for various reasons, and, and Laura could um, give us more input here, but of developing projects on, on the built environment, while absolutely worthy of um, of our focus and support at the town level and the state level uh, is is uh, is is going to be uh, more difficult, challenging, slower pushback on those from from landowners, building owners, and so forth. So it's 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 it, it's also a harder market to penetrate, um, and so we want to keep that in mind as well. Um, okay. Um, Martha? Uh, yes. I'd, I'd like to say that I think we're really in the middle of a paradigm shift in our discussions of climate change. You know, climate change, as we realized from witnessing the events of ongoing in the past couple of years, climate change is here. It's here to stay. It's no more reversible than trying to unscramble an egg at this point. And as a result, our dialogue really now has to be focused on two important aspects. The one, of course, what climate mitigation would, is we have to do as much as we possibly can to mitigate the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which means you know, uh, driving less, uh, converting to renewable energy, stopping fossil fuels, and increasing the drawdown from the atmosphere. And so that's on the one hand, climate mitigation, but then what's becoming equally important now as we look around the world at the events of the past couple of years, even right here in Massachusetts, is um, climate resilience. And that's in fact what the Healy administration is emphasizing now. And that means what do we do to protect our people and our resources from the impacts of extreme events? And so we need to also look at that when we're considering the role of forests or other types of land and so on that we need to uh, protect our people. And so that's what I see also as an important role for forests. Um, and then also, I agree with what others have said that really the area that we're focusing on in this discussion is really a small part of Amherst. You know, I'm particularly concerned about the area where people are on private water supplies and um, do we wanna make stronger restrictions there than we do on other sections of town. And outside of that area up there, you know, not too far from Atkins Reservoir in that general Northeast area, I'm not sure there is all that much forested land that's, uh, you know, we need to talk about. So I don't think we really are in a discussion of, oh dear, we're going to be uh, eliminating some large portion of land if we put 
uh, restrictions on forests and recognize their multiple roles, both in climate sequestration and in climate resilience. So that's my big picture statement from your uh, cosmic astronomer here. <laughs> all right, thanks. <clears throat> um, all right, good. Um, how about we we um, move on to the other categories um, and sort of talk about this somewhat more holistically um, as we as we um, um, continue this conversation, if that works for folks. Um, so the second category um, was with regard with regard to the soils and soil preservation, um, and I guess I was I was. Um, and and Martha had had um, in in her recommendation had sort of outlined a fair amount of of uh, protections for for uh, soils and so forth, which was basically akin to I think uh, what we discussed last time with regard to protection of of soils that are deemed of uh, prime prime farm prime soils or soils of statewide importance, and I guess I was. Um, you know, my thought there was that um, <clears throat> some forest land uh, is based on the GIS map. Uh, some forest land uh, is has these prime soils, and some forest land doesn't. Uh, don't. Um, so, uh, my thought would be in terms of the soil preservation. Uh, if that's what we're trying to do in terms of, of preserving that that uh, those soils, so that um, ultimately they may be able to to be used for food production um, at some point. Um, um, that um, if if they if they are uh, prime prime soil prime soils or state uh, uh, um, soils of statewide importance, um, that uh, we apply the same restrictions. Uh, as we did, as we talked about last time on farmland, uh, and this would be um, construction methods that assure that the uh, soils aren't disturbed or removed to, to a large extent, um, that they are, uh, there's no uh, concrete uh, that the, the um, in the footings, that the, that the land can be returned to um, condition whereby it could be used for food production or farmland um, after uh, after this life of the solar array. Now it's going to be a little bit different because uh, this this uh, even though these are prime soils, there's still going to be a lot of of uh, tree trunks and roots and so so forth that probably have to be um, worked on by the solar developer. Uh, but we we can address address those issues as uh, as well. Um, okay, um, Martha, I think you were first. Uh, yeah, so my reasons for inserting that uh, section for us to consider were really threefold. One is we know from research studies that maybe about at least half of the carbon storage in a forest is in fact in the soils. And so by minimizing the soil disturbance, we minimize the release of that carbon, even if we cut down the trees. So that was one important reason. Um, the, the other was thinking about, uh, you know, topsoil erosion and so on. The more you disturb the soil, uh, the more likely you are then to have problems with erosion, stormwater, and so on. Uh, and third, then I was reading the Pioneer Valley, um, you know, Solar Best Practices Guide from the Planning Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and they had um, quite a discussion of that. And I kind of was taking uh, the requirements, at least in spirit, if not the literal words, uh, from that document too. And so that was; those were my three reasons for putting it in. And I kind of. You know, repeated some of the things we'd had in the in the farmland uh, section. It really kind of is uh, what you might call best practices, in a sense of just trying to be conservative in the way you you're shoving the dirt around, 
as you uh, as you do it. I did not see it as something that was overly burdensome or restrictive. But the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission talks about, oh, you don't want to make big piles of topsoil that then as soon as you have a heavy rain, it's all going to erode away and fall on the roads. You really have to cover it up and, you know, put barriers around the outside, you know, to protect that pile of dirt from uh, going anywhere. And, and so, you know, that just gives us things to think about there. Okay. I'm just trying to think how do those um, differ in the case of a forest land than, than the other part of the bylaw that we've paid some attention to a number of months ago at this point on construction, best construction practices to, to assure to the best ability possible that uh, soil erosion, stormwater runoff and so forth is not, is not an issue. Um, yeah. and so I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, maybe looking at is, is that is what we have generally for construction requirements uh, sufficient for um, to, 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 to protect uh, the situation if it's, if it was a forest um, or is there some sp special and additional provisions that we would have to make for, uh, for um, given the fact that it was, was a previously forest land. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know who is first, but Janet, we'll go with this time and then Bob. Okay, so I, I think this is a situation where I feel like I need more information about like how a solar array is put into. Like I talked to Jake Marley and, you know, farmland is pretty flat and, um, you know, it is obviously, you know, you're putting in roads and you're compacting soil and, you know, you could space, you know, so it's, it's flat, you can preserve your topsoil, you know, put in your plugs, there is disturbance. Um, that's kind of less soil disturbance, but I think in the forest, it's not like you're just going to plug in some solar arrays. You're going to clear cut it, hopefully use that wood and not, you know, burn it or whatever, let it go. But also you're going to grub it. You're going to remove all the, all the, the roots of all the trees. And so I, that to me seems like a huge release of carbon, but also a huge disturbance of soil. And that, it has to it has to be different in terms of impacts. I'm wondering, like, is there something you know? If the disturbance is so much greater, is there some way to avoid that or mitigate that? Um, also, the issue of slopes. You know, most farms are on slopes, um, and so you know, a 15% slope is you know, the, if it's at it seems like there's more soil disturbance and runoff even during construction. And then also in Erin Jakes's comments to the draft white paper, she identified some, you know, many, many impacts to soil in terms of, you know, how much nitrogen they hold, carbon they hold. The fact is that it's much hotter under the array and that changes things. And it really has impacts on the water system um, and the water supply system. And so, um, and how that soil will function going forward. So I'd like maybe us to look at, get more information on that before we say, oh, let's just use the farm standards. I wonder if there's some, you know, we, you know, what happens to the soil? What could happen? We have Williamsburg, which is like a, you know, a terrible example, but I think, I feel like I need more information on this area. I don't, I just think, you know, grubbing a forest and removing everything is different from putting some plugs in, you know, beautiful mm -hmm. land. Um, maybe Laura can shed some light on, on, on this in terms of what, what practices are currently if she's had that experience. <clears throat> um, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Bob, did you um, go yet? I think throughout here, I would just hope that we can just try to keep the standards and requirements as consistent as possible across and not try to come up with additional restrictions for forests and additional restrictions for farmland. I would prefer we just have, you know, a set of standards that were required for this kind of development and not try to come up with this huge laundry list of restrictions. Um, I understand what Janet was saying. I thought that was Insightful, and I don't know either um, exactly how much disturbance, obviously more on forest land. Um, but I would like to keep our, our standards as consistent as possible across the bylaw. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's why, if, you know, if, if we can cover it in the general part of the bylaw with regard to protecting against erosion and so forth during construction, let's just cover it there. Um, and, and, and then, and then um, you know, maybe only some s small incremental uh, um, provisions associated with forest land if, uh, to the extent that they are, um, th there's additional concerns. Um, okay, let me, let's um, move over to the, um, uh, what I've sort of categorized together is uh, uh, view sheds and water supply protection. Um, so in terms of water supply protection, part of that is uh, during construction and what we were just talking about in terms of uh, uh, runoff after rain events and erosion during that very sensitive construction pro process. Um, and, and until the ground cover is is um, uh, established. Um, again, uh, I'd like to think about whether that is really um, can be covered sufficiently in the uh, sections that we already have um, considered, uh, but we'll reconsider before we make anything final uh, with regard to the construction uh, process for all of these uh, solar units. Um, and we talked a little bit about that already. Uh, but then in terms of, um, I guess we have two, or at least suggested here as a starting point, um, two um, restrictions uh, that are one focused more on the view shed and one more on the water, su water supply. Um, Um, one is to, you know, the, the, the idea of if this isn't, is in a forest, we don't necessarily want to, uh, we want to do as, as much as we can to, um, protect, uh, uh, the, the, um, view sheds of, of our, of our forest land, particularly, particularly, but not maybe only along scenic roads. We've talked about buffers already for any of the projects. Uh, Janet seems open to maybe relaxing those in, in, in other situations. But um, uh, I think we, I, I, I think we had a hundred feet is where I think I came up with this, but I have to double check on that. Um, but, um, and, and maybe we don't need a special provision here if it's consistent with the uh, buffer uh, that we've already had. But the idea here would be that that buffer uh, between a roadway or a, um, uh, or a residential abutters uh, would have to uh, be maintained in the uh, existing forest. Uh, so you still have that forest buffer um, between roads and abutters um, before you get to the cleared area that may that would be for the solar array. Um, Chris? So are we talking about a different setback for areas that are um, forested versus a setback for um, some place that isn't forested because we did decide or we came close to deciding on um, setbacks for solar installations in general. Um, and I think we were talking about a 50 foot front yard setback and maybe a 30 foot side yard setback. Okay. Um, um, but are you saying that for forested areas, I'm sorry, this is making a noise, um, that <clears throat> the setback should be greater well, I guess that's an open question. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'd, I'd I would lean towards keeping it the way it is for the other setbacks, unless there's a reason to go larger or or wider. Um, I guess my the main thing I was trying to get across here, at least as a as a starting point, was that that buffer area would be retained in the um, uh, in the undisturbed forest, uh, so that uh, and I and that might be different in this case of, of uh, uh, treed uh, forest land, as opposed to other buffers we talked about in terms of, of uh, types of shrubs and so forth. But the idea here would be to um, require, uh, if, if that's what we wanna do, uh, that this buffered area is maintained in, in uh, the undisturbed forest, um, obviously with the exception of a roadway that might have to go through in, in certain places. 
Um, yeah, uh, Janet and then Martha. Yeah. I sort of share Chris's confusion a little bit. I would, I if we're gonna, I would pull the watershed separate from the water supply issues because I don't think they're really the same thing. And so, um, is do we in in terms of the other buffer areas we had, did we have a 300 foot buffer from, um, I'm sorry, a hundred foot buffer from residential abutters in the rest of the bylaw, Chris? I can't remember. No, we did not. Um, I so think she said 50. My microphone. Um, so we did not, we had 30 and 50, and then okay. we said a hundred feet from scenic roads. Okay, so okay. I would just, I, I don't think these are really analogous they're not similar. Like, so I, I would pull the, you know, let's look at the view shed separately. And then in terms of the water supply, I would just say water supply and watershed protection. Um, Cause there's a lot of, you know, that's, a, those are different issues. And in terms of those, my question is, are these sufficient to protect the watershed, the groundwater, the recharge area? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, especially after reading Aaron Jakes's stuff. And so I wondered if we would ask Aaron to look at what we're putting in for protection and maybe Jonathan Thompson or somebody else who's sort of an expert in that to say, is this sufficient to protect the water supply, the groundwater supply? Um, and also the the rivers and, you know, it's not, it's not all, the rivers aren't all just about us drinking water and things like that. So I would, um, but the view shed question, I think we should just parse out separately. They're not really related. Yeah, and I, I, I was just categorizing together just for, um, expediency i think uh, obviously there are different different issues so let's get to the watershed one uh and the water supply one in 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 a moment um i think for the for the view shed um i think there's some question about what the distance uh or the width might be uh appropriate and whether there's justification for making it um anything um uh, wider uh for forest land um, I'm not suggesting there there is, um, uh, but just something we have to, to think about, um, and that uh, the idea there would be to um, require that it stays in in uh, in 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 the undisturbed forest as that buffer buffer zone. I mean, could I ask you a question? Was your sense that somebody who lives in that area of town obviously has chosen a much quieter um, life or, you know, a, a very different ecosystem than I have on Southeast Street, you know, you know, which has a lot of people and cars. I also chose it because of, you know, the farm next door. So I, is your, did you increase that because your sense that these people wanted more solitude and less impacts is, I mean, which is helpful to me, but I just yeah. wonder if that was your thinking. My thinking was, um, I, well, let's, first profess that I didn't overthink this. I just um, put something down and I'm not sure whether I got the 100 feet. I don't want to state that I did, but maybe that was in Martha's draft. I don't know. Uh, but the idea there was that um, uh, that to the extent that these are larger arrays uh, and that um, I think from the community uh, um, perspectives we heard, um, uh, probably a lot of, of the concerns about solar and forest was the aesthetics of, of, uh, of, of seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea would be, and I was just trying to visualize, okay, how, you know, if it's a 30 foot width of forest, can you sort of see to the other end of the forest fairly readily and then see the, uh, see the array, see that there's an array there. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm sure I didn't do an ex experiment uh, and I figured a hundred feet and these are larger arrays, so maybe on larger properties so they could afford more of a buffer and why put it close to the abutters if you can put it sort of in the middle of a parcel or away from the abutters. Um, that was my, my, uh, uh, thinking there. Okay. Yeah. Nothing more than that. Uh, Chris, please. We may want to think about how big these arrays are because, um, we have said that our regulations are going to apply to anything that's 250 kW or greater. And we've um, understood that the current situation is that 250 kW is about an acre. Yeah. So if someone had a forest uh, area that they wanted to convert to solar and it was about an acre that they were going to convert, 
than to require yeah. a hundred foot buffer, you know, on all sides or, you know, yeah. against the road that really takes away from a lot of their property. So maybe we say something about for, you know, solar arrays that are smaller than five acres that um, these large Good setbacks don't apply, but for yeah. solar arrays that are bigger than five acres that these would apply. Okay. Okay. I think that's, that's a good point for sure. Okay. Um, all right. So let's think about that. I, I like the idea of sort of sticking with the um, normal buffer that we have, the universal buffers that we have for, uh, for the, these arrays in general, but then maybe looking to um, require a, a bit more of a, of a width of a buffer in the case of larger um, acreage. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and five megawatts would, I mean, five acres would be going on a megawatt of, uh, of solar. Yeah. Um, Martha. Uh, yes. So um, first, I, I would uh, ag agree with Chris that perhaps the, the buffer size should uh, depend on the, uh, what's going to be the, the clear cut area and the array size. And I would also agree with uh, saying that really the forest case is different from just an open land case. You know, it's not a question of the pretty view. And I, I would disagree that uh, members of the public want to preserve forests because it's, you know, they like the view. Uh, members of the public are really concerned about uh, the values that forests provide. And I think that's why we have the overwhelming majority of, of residents that say preserve forests. But so I, I would say my concern, the reason for suggesting the larger buffer when forests are cleared was more the hydrology. You know, if you have a residence and, you know, a certain, your certain lot size, maybe you have an acre or uh, half an acre, I don't know, but your residence, and if you're next to a, a a forested area, you know, it is going to impact the drainage, erosion, and so on. And so I just feel that having a, a significant buffer uh, in the case of clearing the forest is a protection for the neighbors and their residences, not because it's pretty, I mean, yeah, that's nice too, but just because of the dis disturbance. And so I would say certainly a minimum of a hundred foot buffer uh, next to a residence. And uh, also I think that, you know, the, the zoning bylaws in general have rules about the minimum lot coverage or maximum lot coverage in certain residential zones too um, that goes with that. But all right, good. Um, and I do want to be, I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm we none of us know the answers to every every question we have. Um, yeah. uh, and we 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 won't know those as we <laughs> finalize. Uh, these rules. Um, but I do want to be careful in terms of, I think there's, in terms of erosion and runoff and so forth, I think there's two very distinct things. One is during construction, uh, that is a very sensitive time with regard to those issues. Uh, when it comes to the array itself, yeah. in, it, in its mature yeah. operation for 20, 20 plus years, um, where there's a, a, a robust ground cover um, in and around the array, I don't I, I'm I'm a little bit lost uh, with regard to uh, you know what is really the impacts and the experiences that um, projects have had uh, with regard to uh, changes in these um, uh, runoff, percolation, uh, groundwater, uh, and so forth uh, during that longer period of operation. Uh, and I don't want to obviously there's some impact. But is it de minimis, uh, or is it um, substantial? Uh, and uh, you know that that I think we've gotten some in, uh, some some uh, um, uh, opinions on and, and thoughts on. But um, I don't know if we're going to get to full um, knowledge on that. 
Yeah. Yes. So it really, I mean, from what I've seen, construction projects can go on for a very long time, months or year or even a couple of years or so, so that I think the buffer zone during the construction phase is, is indeed very important. And that's where, when all the changes are taking place. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Janet. So I do think, I don't think we can say we don't know, have enough information, let's just proceed. Is that, you know, I when I talked to Michael DeCara uh, maybe a year ago, or maybe not a year, maybe nine months ago, I said, you know, he said it took five years on their Shootsbury thing to establish grass. It was just a real struggle. And so, you know, that could be just one situation, but someone knows the answer to this, you know, so you have slopes, you remove most of the soil, even if you put it back, something has to hold it. Um, you know, it's not farmland, you know, I, you know, I, at the Air Carl Museum, they established this amazing, you know, meadow in th two years, a year. And I know there's a really good grass under the Hampshire College. It looks very similar. I think the Carl might look better in the sense they have like no non-native species, but I know that that can be established, but if they're struggling to establish something like that in a forest, we need to know that if that's just a one a one time situation or is that common, you know, um, and so, you know, and then the prime soils or the topsoil might be not as deep in a forest or deeper and there's more loss. I just, I think these are answers we could, I think we have to get answers to that. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I think you can get information on that. I'm not sure if you can get answers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for information. <laughs> um, because there's there's way too much that is depends and you look at it one place it's going to be different than another place and uh we can we can uh you know maybe get some it, it seem i think jack has some expertise in this area uh as well as uh laura some some experience um Are chris soils people at umass that could help us um I mean, I've had there's one researcher I've been working with that's looking at, um, but he's you know still trying to do some research on on um, effects of uh, uh, solar rays on groundwater, uh, uh, but that's uh, he's still trying to do some work on that. But I can ask him if he has any um, anything that he might be able to share with us. Okay. Um, I, may I just say, yeah, Chris? Yes, yeah, so. please. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody that we have maybe six weeks to finish this up. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have a limited amount of time to do a lot of research. And I, in particular, have, you know, many, many other projects besides this that I'm working on. So I can't devote large amounts of time to this particular project. And I must say that our, you know, effort in this regard is very broad and deep and if you know if you take a look at Belchertown's solar bylaw or Hadley's solar bylaw they're really much pared down and so I guess I question how many different things can we examine and put into this bylaw and I just wanted to remind people that a bylaw is changeable you know, if you put something in place, maybe we should look at this as put in place the best that we can do now and understand that over the years, this can be changed. We'll learn new things and we'll change based on our knowledge as it evolves. Um, so trying to make this, you know, perfect at this time may be unrealistic and trying to make it good enough maybe what we should strive for at this moment, because there will be other solar projects coming along the pipeline. And we want to make sure that we have something in place when they come along. You know, unfortunately, we missed the boat with the, um, you know, Schutz Ferry Road project. But I'm just encouraging us to think um, about, you know, putting something in place that's good enough for now, knowing that we can always uh, change it in the future once our understanding and experience evolves. Thank you.
Yep, and I also want to, I mean, to the extent that, um, I mean, there there may be certain situations, I don't know, where um, a landowner sells off some forested land and somebody builds a house that might take up five acres uh, or three acres. Um, what are they, are they bound by, obviously there's going to be some permitting with regard to uh, stormwater control during construction and so forth. Um, but um, um, I'm just wondering if, if, if there's any precedent for any of the restrictions we're talking, potentially talking about um, or, or scientific concerns uh, that we're talking about that has been raised or are applicable to other um, um, uh, situations where there is some forest that could be cut down to build something else. Okay. Um, all right, Janet. So cognizant of what Chris just said and what Robert has said um, is I think that the way to simplify the bylaw and not have to have requirements for each kind of like, okay, well, now we're on farmland, now we're in forest, now we're in a watershed, you know, now we're just, you know, on some, you know, whatever bare land or whatever, or a field is basically to say, if we just said, okay, this forest area, this kind of forest land, because of its import, ecological importance and drinking water supply and, you know, the monotonous list I keep saying, or Martha keeps saying, or we keep on hearing about in all the state plans and our own town plan, is like we're just not going to have large scale arrays or nothing over an acre or two, you know, so that would be a way to simplify the bylaw by just taking this small area that's very ecologically and important off the list, right? And then, you know, I was going to, I missed the farm discussion, but I think that there's a way to ensure that dual use can take place on a solar array currently or in the future just by a spacing requirement. And so if we had a simple spacing requirement, keeping the land open and available for future farming or current farming, we don't have to require dual use, we'll just have it available for dual use. And then we can get down to sort of like, okay, we have a general list of things and requirements. And so I think if we just, you know, basically say different rules, you know, different rules for different types of stuff, and we can go through this kind of nitpicky thing, or we can just say, we're gonna set aside these areas Farmland is treated this way. The forests are off, off the chart, you know, whatever. And these other areas, we have a lower permitting requirement because this is where we'd like to see it. That could be the simplification and, you know, have a swifter bylaw. But I, do, I think that, you know, with fewer requirements overall. So if we make these decisions or consider that as an option, I think you could, you know, tighten this up quite a bit. All right. Um... Chris and then Bob. So one thing that we learned from Jonathan um, Murray was yep. that it is okay to limit the size of clear cutting for solar arrays. In fact, he pointed to Belchertown's new bylaw, which limits forest clearing to five acres. Um, and then he also said that if you wanted to offer a bonus to people, um, for clearing more acres or not really a bonus, but like an incentive to do the right thing, that um, if they clear more than five acres, then you have them set aside um, forest in another location and put a deed restriction on it. So that's something that we could consider doing, you know, have a pretty restrictive amount of forest that could be cleared. But then if someone wishes to clear more than that, allow them to set aside forest in another location, just um, putting that out there for uh, Possibility, possibility. Yep. Okay. Hmm. Makes sense to me, Chris. <laughs> um, I guess one thing, Chris, I, I that I've been looking for, but uh, to help me get a handle on that is um, a layer on the GIS map that we have that would uh, enable us to sort of toggle. Um, uh, and sort of clearly see the size distribution of the of the parcels that we have, particularly uh, throughout Amherst, but particularly up in that north corner, north northern region, 
uh, so be able to see, okay, if we did have a restriction of no more than um, X number of acres, we could see, um, you know, how many parcels are there that actually have, that are of that size. I've looked, you know, a little bit on the map just by clicking on some of the larger blocks I can see, and they seem to be some parcels that are like 20, even 40, I think, acres, uh, but there's not a whole lot of them, um, and there's not, as far as I could tell, there weren't like any that were like 100 acres or anything, um, and um, it would be, I think it would be useful, if I'm blocking on the uh, GIS person's name from your office, or from the town. Mike, Mike Borner. Yeah, Mike, yeah, exactly. Um, um, if um, he might be able to add, he's, in, in the conversation we had when he was with us, he said it wouldn't be hard. I know it takes time and, and, and attention, but um, that, that would, in my mind, that would be um, helpful to be able to be able to see that on the, on the map. You mean add property lines to the map? Well, we have property lines, but um, uh, but uh, something that we could say, okay, show me all the parcels that are over 20 acres. Yeah, um, you know, have those or, or you know, or or you know, may, maybe above five, 10, and 20 mm -hmm. acres would be good mm -hmm. increments to be able to um, sort of see what we're talking about in terms of the the number of properties and and where those properties are. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can investigate that. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So that, that's um, helpful, Chris, to hear sort of that approach that we might um, take as well of having not a necessarily a restriction on, on forest, but if you go over a particular uh, threshold of acreage clearing, then certain um, restrictions or requirements um, apply. Um, okay, um, let's just talk briefly about the um, watersheds and the private wells. Um, you know, I think first of all, my understanding is that there are already zoning restrictions across many things uh, with regard to um, building in in a in a water in a defined water supply recharge region uh, and so forth. So we're not talking about that. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, potentially a, a solar project in a forest, which is not in these wetland areas, not in these defined uh, water supply areas, but um, could arguably have an impact uh, on those um, proximate perhaps um, recharge areas and also um, uh, for water supply and also private drinking wells. Um, and again, I think there's two issues here. One is is uh, protection during construction um, and second during operation. Um, um, and um, so, you know, one approach may be, well, just you, you can't do solar, <laughs> but um, uh, but if we were to, you know, look at how could we restrict solar to be um, uh, recognize concerns and potential uh, uh, impacts, um, the idea that I I had here at least was to um, it would go maybe go in it's aligned with the buffer uh, issue, but here to purpose purposefully. Uh, provide for a larger buffer zone. And, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it depends on whether it's uphill or downhill, for example, um, but um, a, a larger uh, buffer uh, in terms of distance um, so that um, we, we extend uh, a, a bit more protection uh, uh, for private wells. Um, again, this is, I think, primarily prevalent up in that Northeast area as well. Um, uh, so that we have a larger distance between where this forest clearing would, would start in any uh, on any of its perimeter and have uh, what I've sort of thrown out here just as a as a starting point 300 feet um, from any um, any private well. Uh, I don't know how that maps out. 
uh, in terms of what the private wells and whether that's a, a layer that's also on GIS um, and how that would map out uh, and whether that would be um, an appropriate form of, of protection uh, for these uh, for these uh, private wells, particularly, and but also the the, the recharge areas. Um, again, recognizing this is on top of very careful constraints and re requirements during construction, but then during the the this is more about the operation of the array. Um, that uh, with it, you know, it's it's. I think there's been suggestion that there's not a whole lot of um, concern about toxics or anything like that. Uh, the battery is a little bit of a different issue, but in terms of the solar array, um, but it would have some impacts on on um, that we don't really know and won't know with certainty. And it's going to be different in every different parcel of forest uh, in terms of what the impact is on groundwater flow uh, and 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 um, attributes of that groundwater. Um, so how do people? What do people? think on this in terms of at that extra distance from from uh, wells, for example. Um, Chris. Isn't that something that um, Jack Jemsick would know about? He's a hydrogeologist, yeah. right? So he would exactly. be able to advise us about this. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and um, this is just to start the conversation. This is a situation where I, I definitely wouldn't want to um, make any decisions or, or get too far without Jack's input on this. Janet. Um, I agree with your questions and the 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 idea, the concept of it. And um, you know, my question would be like, how do we figure out what the drinking water recharge area is? And you know, maybe that's already been done. Um, and if it's not been done, I would assume that ha would have to be mapped by someone. And but the, so I what I was referring to there was the already mapped. There, there are defined, I mean, we've seen that on the maps already and and of, and took that off the map for solar development of these um, the water recharge areas. Yeah, I think that's I, for some reason this is a, probably a good question for Jack because I think that was for public drinking water supplies. Yeah, not yeah, 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 yeah. So I I, I support what you're the we're like all the your questions and also where you're heading. Okay. Um. Okay, um, let me let me ask the group where we want to go from here. Um, again, I think this has been a helpful discussion just to hear everybody and to, to get to Chris's point. <laughs> All the discussion's good, but we need to um, get to get to language on a piece of paper uh, or at least in a computer somewhere. Um, and um, um, you know, maybe maybe um, Chris can start drawing something together um, from our conversation today, but I think there's a lot that's still on the table. I don't want to um, rehash what we've already discussed today without bringing in the rest of the committee uh, as well, uh, which hopefully can be next time. We'll, we'll talk about that at the end of the meeting in terms of schedule for the next meeting. Um, but are there any other issues, uh, Martha? You had some other suggestions there. I think you know one, one this this concept of of um, uh, requiring any any forest land removal of forest to be compensated by um, deeded restrictions on forest somewhere else. Um, I think we got um, suggestion that that doesn't look too good legally from Jonathan last time. Um, however, in the case that um, it could be, you can do five acres, but anything above that, maybe that has, um, uh, then, then that sort of kicks in. Um, I think to some of the comments um, that I received before the meeting, there's a lot of pushback to that. Uh, there is some openness to bring this up whether it regards farmland or forest land to the town council is something that the town might want to consider for all development, but not their sort of pushback um, to sort of single out solar development where this these requirements would kick in, whereas other develop, developments it would not. Uh, some concern about a landowner might then opt to 
sell it off for um, some other purpose other than solar, um, like housing or whatever, um, if those uh, if there were sort of perverse incentives in that way. Um, uh, but let me just open it up to any other um, uh, thoughts people have and, and issues that we should raise uh, with regard to how we look at this with um, forest land. Martha, anything you had in your outline um, and things with that we can uh, tee up for uh, for the for, for a fuller group next time. Yeah. Yep, Martha. Yeah. Well, I just I was just responding to your your comment about uh, the discussion with Jonathan Murray. Didn't Chris just say that it's her understanding that uh, it wouldn't be a, a huge stumbling block to uh, say that for uh, an, a clearing of more than five acres, we would require, you know, some other five acres somewhere to be preserved. So I think that, that, that we should leave that open for discussion and 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 not rule it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think okay. may I just may I just say that I would suggest that you ask our three members who weren't able to come today if they would listen to this recording before our next meeting so that yeah, we wouldn't too. have to start right from scratch and, yeah. and rehash everything all over again. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Would, that, would that be a, a suggestion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and maybe... And I'll try to get the minutes done in a timely okay. way too, means and listening to the recording and everything. Yeah. Chris, <laughs> do you happen to know when Stephanie will be back? Monday. Monday, Monday, okay. Monday. Okay, yeah. so I'm just what I when I when I end the recording, I guess Stephanie gets it somehow. Um and, and so I'll ask Stephanie to let me know when it gets posted so that um everybody can listen to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um all right, Janet, and then I want to open it up to uh any comments from Eric. <clears throat> um <Just> to clarify. <clears throat> saying we're going to start with Martha's stuff next and the, with the hope that everybody's like we don't rehash what we just said when the new member the old members come back is that what you're saying when the other members when the rest of the committee um, yeah so you're, you're going to start with Martha's I move through that and then hopefully end up no, I, mean, I, I, I sort of extracted what I thought was good for and I'm scrolling down to Martha's area this ecosystem protection uh, uh, I sort of took took from there um, on soil preservation. Um, I guess there, there there is this open question we discussed today with regard to um, you know is there something special about the forest uh, with regard to uh, soil carbon and so forth that we would want to apply these soil preservation um, requirements regardless of whether it's prime soils or uh, or or not. Um, and so I think we can we sort of um discuss that um and the rest of the stuff the mounting and everything that's if, if we're gonna um if it's prime soil and then if we apply it to the other other uh soils or not then yeah they, these these would be this similar um provisions that we would have in in uh, a more universal part of the of the um uh, bylaw with regard to um soil preservation uh generally uh, and special provisions for prime soils or for forest soils. Okay. Uh, I, and then, yeah, and then uh, um, uh, I think I sort of took this where I got the 300 feet, I guess. Um, uh, so I sort of took took from that and then she had the mitigation, which is basically this, this issue with regard to whether a um, solar developer would have to uh, restrict development somewhere else. Uh, or, or sorry, sorry, conserve forest somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that is a very quick summary, and I think maybe the one thing that she has added is this idea of critical natural landscapes. I mean, we could talk about that next week. So. Okay. Okay. It's, just, it's a little broader. All right. Um, Great. Okay, so before we go to the, um, let me uh, stop sharing here, just uh, um, bring up the agenda again. Um, um, 
seem to seem to have the agenda still up, or maybe it's on hold. Um, let me ask in terms of um, um, next meeting, um, which is. September 1st. Sorry, so September 1st. That's, um, is that, that's Labor Day weekend, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, or, or the Friday before Labor Day weekend, I should say. Okay, so, um, yeah, so um, amongst us that are here, um, who, who has a, who cannot make it on September 1st? Anybody? I, I'm not sure. I, I would like not to make it. I would, I'd be really happy if we moved that to a different, like even the following, you know, whatever the following week sometime. Maybe yeah. we should, do, maybe we should pull the people missing too. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> well, let's, let's keep it standing for the moment, but we'll pull uh, other folks. Um, and um See, um, see if we can uh, find a time that we can all make sure that we can all meet. Um, I'm also um, I, I guess I'd be open to starting to meet every week uh, if people <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, maybe, maybe we'll cut into that in, in uh, October when we're really facing the deadline. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. Robert, so Robert is a man of few words, but a lot of expressiveness. <laughs> <laughs> a pretty, pretty clear silence, I think, on that yes. one. <laughs> it's, it's volumes. <laughs> um, and that's I, I can I can appreciate that. Um, so let's let's anticipate meeting on the first our normal time, uh, but when Stephanie gets back, um, I'll try to work with her to get a sense of uh, availability from everybody uh, and then make adjustments as, as we need. Um, okay. Um, okay, here's the agenda. I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, Okay. Uh, so then, yeah. So the that's the next meeting. Okay. Um, and I think what we'll um, what we'll cover is uh, try to hone in on our conversation and approach on force. Uh, it would be good to go back and look at uh, what we did discuss and and how that translated into bylaw language with regard to farmland. Um, and then I think importantly. Uh, we also then need to start looking at the bylaw as a whole. Um, and, and and thank you, Chris, for sending that latest draft out. Uh, what I did find there was that um, there's a lot of comments that have been added and, and appreciate that those are in uh, track changes or at least different colors uh, so that we can see that. But um, um, I think a lot of those comments um, you know, were put in there based on on comments you've received, Chris, which is is great to have those, but we haven't really discussed them as a group in terms of um, whether they should stay or not or be tweaked in some way. Um, and so um, I think um, we'll we'll get to that um, as, as well uh, um, and get as far as we can the next next time. And then I think hopefully we'll have forest and farmland, uh, sort of settled on in terms of where we want to go, hopefully, and then spend the net last month, I guess, of the of the um, working group in um, really reviewing and um, uh, finalizing the draft um, of of the of in its entirety. If all goes well, <laughs> okay, um, okay. So with that, let me um, open it up to any comments from the public. Uh, just for the record, we have um, nine attendees. Uh, so if anybody from the attendee group would like to make a comment, 
uh, please raise your hand and I will allow you to talk. And I'm gonna go with Tom and then Lenore and then uh, Michael uh, and allow that in, in that order. So Tom, um, please let us know who you are and, and, and appreciate um, your comment. You, you should be able to speak now, hopefully. Tom, we can't hear you if you are speaking. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear oh, me good. now? Oh, yeah, yeah, good, good. Yeah, now oh, we can. All right, sorry yeah. about that. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I feel we're in one of those old Verizon commercials. Can you hear me now? Anyway, <laughs> hey, guys, I, I, I guess the camera's not on. That's all right. So it's just audio. Uh, yeah. For you, yes. Yeah. All right, right. Like, no, 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 no problem. Come. I, I just want to say real quick, I, I know time is of the essence, that I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. This is important work. Uh, I live in South Amherst. I'm a property owner. I greatly appreciate the work you're doing. And I know that this is a balance between uh, uh, the need for green energy and the need for preserving forested land and open space and all that good stuff. I, I, I just want to say um, I, 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 uh, I, 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 my, my wish is for this bylaw to, to, to include things like um, to, 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 to prioritize rooftop solar, parking lot solar, if possible, if possible, over cutting down forests and trees. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I know there's got to be a balance and I know there's got to be some give and take here, but cutting down a uh, mature growth forest of oak trees, maples, whatever, birch, hickories, uh, to, to put in a solar array reminds me of, you know, burning the village down in order to save it. It didn't work very well in Vietnam at all. Um, we have limited forest lands in, in Amherst, and I just want to preserve the forest and the trees. I would just much rather see solar arrays going on rooftops and um, parking lots. Of course, yeah, I know that there's a more capital cost of putting a solar array up on a rooftop, uh, rather a parking lot. I saw, I watched the projects at UMass, those huge masts, yeah, there is a more upfront capital cost to putting uh, solar masts up in a parking lot. I, I get that, I get that. But my understanding is rooftop solar, when available and when appropriate, is less costly than clear cutting a field or or, or a forest to put in uh, brackets for, for solar panels. Again, this is just my take, and I, I, I know you guys are doing good work in trying to find this balance. Boy, I, I just... Uh, and I appreciate that. Yeah, we put solar on top of the high school, whatever it was, 100 kilowatts, I believe. Yeah, it's not the same as a huge field. But then if you include the the uh, the parking lot at the high school, I, then you're kind of getting there. But I know this is uh, there's a there's a trade off here. You know, I, I live in South Amherst. I, I walk around Hickory Ridge and I scratch my head. There's a lot of beautiful trees that are rotting on the ground. And I'm just like, uh, excuse the French, WTF. Boy, I, I, I just think this is an important issue. I want to preserve our forests and our trees. And I, I appreciate the time you guys are putting into this and the good work that you're doing. And I'll, I'll end my comments there. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Tom, for the, minute, for the minutes, may I please have your last name? Sure. My last name is Jamate. J A M A T E. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom, for those comments. All right. Great. Uh, Lenore, you're up next and letting you in now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, great. Hi, guys. This is Lenore Brick. Thank you for your good work, as always. Um, I want to address a couple of things. I, there's some fundamental uh, assumptions I think that we need to look at. One, one thing is this idea of balance. It's interesting because we are already so out of balance that we have to think of balance in a completely different way. Um, I think of it more as what are our non-negotiables? Not like we have to balance this with this and that. There is no more balancing. Um, and the non-negotiables for me with everything that I've learned is what's precious and what actually uh, has been regulating the climate since before 
we, but since before humans decided that their technologies were superior to nature's technologies. And so if we understand that there are these non-negotiables, if we understand that all soil disturbance, whether it's forest soil disturbance, farm soil disturbance, all fragmenting uh, habitats, all soil disturbance impacts soil health and microbiology in the soil because soil is not dirt. Soil is life and it's potential life. And that understanding can um, inform how we think about these decisions because all of that impacts climate and public health. And so these non-negotiables to me are about protecting all of the soils, all of the forest, all of the farmlands, because that's what Amherst has, a, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of kind of updated climate scientists, has a moral obligation to protect. And this idea that, you know, this kind of fair share idea is also a strange out of balance balance because each town and city and municipality has something different to offer. Not every area in the state has green land. Not every area in the state has a lot of built landscape. And you're in a pickle. I, I appreciate that because you have to set up these bylaws in isolation from the rest of the state. That's absurd. And to, to set it up uh, from, you know, in isolation from the rest of the region, that's absurd that we're operating as an independent tiny town. And what's even more absurd is that we, you know, Amherst, because we're a college town, we should be doing everything in collaboration with the university and colleges because that's half our town. And if we are not working with them, then we're not operating even as all of Amherst. So there's just some of these kind of fundamental um, uh, obstacles that you're working under that tie your hands that I'm sorry that you are because it shouldn't be that way. Um, if, if the European colonialists had understood the, the preciousness and treasured the land, if it, we wouldn't be in this pickle. We wouldn't even need solar technology because green technology is solar technology. <laughs> Nature is solar technology. So anyway, I appreciate the pickle you're in and what you're doing. Um, and I, I, I also, one last thing I want to say, I think the, the point that um, Chris and, and Janet and a few of you brought up, that you can create a bylaw and then tweak it later, my uh, hope would be that you actually create a bylaw that honors these non-negotiables, that is more conservative, because you're not going to get back what gets cut down. You're not gonna get the soil back. You're not gonna get the forest back. But if we need more of it, then we can give more of it, but don't give away what you can't get back initially. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lenore. All right, great. Um, Michael and then uh, Eric, I see your hand up as well. You'll go next. Um, so Michael, you're up. Oh my gosh, such such hard acts to follow here. Um, I know you guys are fading a little bit, but my my comments have a little audience participation involved in them. So hopefully that'll be something to, to uh, perk you up a little bit. Um, I, unbelievable discussion today was fantastic. I followed every minute of it. The, I think one of the key points is, uh, especially when you're talking about meadows versus uh, forest, is the overall ecological impact. And because you're often talking in ibs, uh, abstract things, you know, this this acreage or that acreage, I like to really focus on real things that are happening in town. And the previous speaker talked about Hickory Ridge, which is happening in town. And it's a perfect example of an established meadow it used to be a golf course. It's become a wild meadow, absolutely chock full of bees, flowers, really thick grasses, so thick that I'm amazed at how little succession has actually taken place there. It almost seems like the, the grass is so firmly established that the trees can't really take hold. Anyway, it's a, it's a perfect example of a, an established meadow. 
I'm not going to argue whether it should have been done or, or not done. It's, you know, that's water over the dam and the trees are lying there and they've been there for nine months. Um, that, that's what it is. But what I do want to talk about is the ecological impact when that's developed as a solar field. When they go up there, they're going to pound in posts and they're going to put in a racking system and they're going to put in some electronics. The actual disturbance of the soil, certainly they're going to be running vehicle, tracked vehicles over them as they bring the solar panels out and as they bring those metal things out. But the actual disturbance of the topsoil is going to be minimal. 20 years from now, after not sitting there, and if they were to rip everything out again, the actual disturbance of that topsoil and that meadow would be minimal. So I look at that as the overall ecological impact as far as the soil is very tiny. Now, I want to go to the other side of the town and with the Shootsbury Road project, which is the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It's 40 acres in a forested land. And this is where your audience participation comes in. If you would, if, if you could just draw a square and then take that square and break it into quadrants. And if you don't wanna do it with a pencil and paper on your computer, you can do it in your brain, but just, just have a square that's divided into four quadrants. And the shape of the Shootsbury Road project is not a square, but it takes up 40 square acres, a little bit more actually. So that little, that big square represents 40 square acres. Each one of those small squares is 10 square acres. Now, somewhere on the paper, you can write down this number. If you were to take, say that there were 100 trees per acre on that site, that would be 4,000 trees. Now, I'm not going to argue what a tree is, how big it should be, how wide it is, and whatever. If that's a conservative number, 4,000 trees, I think a more realistic number would probably be 200 trees per acre. That's 8,000 trees in that 40-acre parcel. Now, and compare that to what's going on over Hickory Ridge with the 150 trees that were cut down. The next step is you talked about uh, not having Lori here to describe what's going to happen uh, to the soil. You don't need lawyer, lawyer, sorry, Laura here to explain what happens. I can tell you what happens. Every one of those 8,000 or 4,000 trees is going to be cut down. All the stumps are going to remain and they're going to be either taken out all at once or in phases. Every one of the stumps is ripped out of the ground by a big machine. They shake it like crazy to separate the subsoil from the, and rocks from the roots and the root systems are widespread on these big trees. All that subsoil gets totally mixed up with the existing surface soil. So you end up with this total mess. Um, there's no way to scrape the the topsoil off initially because it's all full of stumps. So all that gets mixed together. They grub it, which someone's always referred to, which is basically coming through and ripping out any other remaining roots or small trees or vegetation that's occurred. That has that process also brings up subsoil, which mixes with the topsoil. So you may have had topsoil there to begin with underneath those trees but you don't anymore. It's this, it's this witch's brew of subsoil and topsoil. Now, you have all these wood products. If you're, if you're working with someone real uh, good, they're going to take the big logs out and sell them and turn them into something useful. Um, usually what happens is most of the stuff gets ground up. It's put into a very large machine, which is a tub grinder. They stick it in the top, grinds at the bottom, comes off a conveyor belt, and gets dumped on a truck or gets dumped in a big pile. All those wood chips then are carried off or they're spread around the site, sometimes mixed with the topsoil, sometimes dumped in four or five foot thick mats on a hillsides adjoining it if you have places that'll um, erode. So if you compare the ecological impact there, we haven't talked about putting in posts yet. All we've talked about is the trees and the soil. And I, I don't think I need to go into much more detail about, you can already see the amount of disturbance compared to what's happening in the meadow. They're completely different creatures. It's, it's like night and day. I don't see how you could, you could compare them. Back to your little drawing, which, it, which represents the Shootsbury Road proposed project. It's divided into four quadrants, 40 acres. So we've just destroyed 40 acre, um, 
um, forest ecological system, cut down either 4,000, 8,000, 6,000 trees, you pick the number. And now what we're going to do is on one of those quadrants, if you color it in, you'll be coloring in a surface area of 10 acres. The surface area of the solar panels that are proposed for the Shutesbury Road site equals 10 acres. Now, that's 10 acres of solar panels put side by side, like you've had a football field and just laid them out next to each other. Obviously, you're not going to do that, that on any commercial solar site, but the surface area is what counts. The surface area is what gathers the sun's energy and turns it into electricity. So you are going to get 10 acres, 10 square acres of solar power. And to get that 10 square acres of solar power from those solar cells, you're destroying another 30 acres of forest. To me, that seems very inefficient from an ecological standpoint. If those same 10 acres of solar panels were taken distributed across the rooftops of Amherst, you'd be generating the same amount of electrical power and you wouldn't be destroying 40 acres of forest. And to me, this idea of this ratio of destruction to benefit, I don't know how you would work it into a, uh, a bylaw, but I think it is something to consider. And you, as you can see, in a meadow area, there's a lot less destruction per kilowatt. Let's put it that way. In a forested area, you're really messing up the environment, destroying an ecosystem to get the same amount of energy. And if you take those same 10 square meters, sorry, 10 square acres of, uh, of solar panels, scatter them around on rooftops, you'd get the same amount of electrical energy. So I'm sorry that was so long-winded, but I think it's an important point. Thank you, Michael. Yep, appreciate that. Okay, um, we're at time, but we're gonna take uh, Eric. Um, <laughs> some latecomers to the, to the uh, hands up. So uh, we will um, go, go a bit over to hear uh, from Eric and then Scott and then Laura. Um, let me please ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, Eric, you're up. Hello. Hello, yeah, hi, can Eric. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Is it my turn, Dwayne? Yes, yes, it is, Eric. Yep. Thank you. I want to thank the committee uh, for extending its time uh, uh, mulling over such difficult, difficult issues, and you're, you're doing a wonderful job. And I do appreciate the granular level at which you are approaching um, uh, um, the uh, solar bylaw um, uh, development. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I live in North Amherst in the Northeast Quadrant and I'm on a well, um, uh, well system that provides our, our, my family's water. 5% of the households in Amherst rely on wells for their drinking water. The large, large majority of those homeowners are in the Northeast um, uh, 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 quarter of Amherst. So um, I, I asked at the January 2021 meeting of the Water Supply Protection Committee, I asked the, um, the committee, well, where does the well water uh, come from? And Lyons Witten, the chair of the committee at the time said, well, we don't know that. So I then I asked whether what what level of risk is the is the town willing to take in order to pro provide or or um, eliminate water for the large uh, any one or many owners of wells in the town. So I really think that it's it's important to consider that. Secondly, um, I think that and we did touch on it. Thank you so much um, today in your discussion. Um, why, why, and I still am confused as to why we are eliminating from the conversation the, uh, the two campuses and the university, the two college campuses and the university as part of the larger 
community um, discussion regarding reaching net zero. I think the, 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 the Amherst College, Hampshire College and UMass own 20% of the town, town's resource, land resources. And for us to eliminate them for the conversation, I think is a, is a lost opportunity. And, um, and as I've said before, the, um, I think that, that we really need to engage everyone. We certainly, the town and the universities and colleges engage uh, the town regarding housing. Why can't we, can't, why can't we engage the campuses in a conversation about reaching, reaching net zero? Um, thank you so much for your hard work and I, and, uh, I, um, I will stay tuned as I always do. For, for, for more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, Scott Cashin is up next, and you can speak now, Scott. All right. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Scott Cashin. I recently relocated to Amherst with my family. Uh, I've been in my new house for about a week now. Um, I am a, a biologist and I've been involved in review of about 100 solar projects in California, um, starting in about 2007. Uh, and so I have a lot of experience in, you know, the permitting, uh, environmental impacts, mitigation. Um, what I think some of, some of my expertise could be useful to the committee and I've just thrown out there that if if I can help in any way, I'd be glad to do so. Thank you. Awesome, uh, sounds like useful expertise and welcome to town, Scott and your family. Um, yeah, what, what, I, I'm not sure what the protocol is there, um, Chris, with regard to him um, connecting with you or Stephanie maybe. Uh, if, he could, his service. if he could, if he could, send me his email address. I'm at the planning department. You could send it to the planning department, which I believe is planning at amherstma.gov. Um, so just, you know, get, get in contact with me and then we can reach out to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Yes, you're welcome. All right. Awesome. Okay, great. And last up is Laura. <clears throat> uh, Laura McLeod, uh, you are able to speak. All right, thank you very much, Dwayne. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Hello, nice to see you guys. And thank you, Martha, Janet, Chris. This is this is a very, very vital job that you are doing, guys, because uh, uh, we are looking at the future. It's not only for 20 years that these panels are going to, to last. And then, of course, what do we do with that? Of course, you have to, I hope you have thought or What's going to happen with those panels? Mm, that's a big problem nowadays, and there is no solution yet for that. Uh, but that's perhaps not your area right now, I understand, and you are thinking sort of the short term, which I don't agree, we should be able to, you are in a, in a wonderful position to think ahead. You must do it, unfortunately, because we are living the echo side a rampant ecocide all over the world with uh, all kinds of threats from nature that we didn't, that we originate. In fact, humans are causing all that. We, we know that. So um, my point is to look beyond and uh, consider facts that there are from international uh, work done on solar from local work done on solar hmm, uh, situations and uh, national work. So that has to come into your consideration in order to have a real picture. Hmm? There are facts, there is information, and you should take a little bit more time searching. If you want to uh, include um, or contact Michael Kellett from restore.org, he will give you lots of expert uh, um, information that I don't have. But I, I'm looking right now at, uh, at uh, one oak tree, one majestic oak tree that sequesters carbon like a star. It's a rock star. 
um, and it is one mature canopy tree uh, captures eight tons of carbon, one. For that to happen, uh, in, in, if you cut down the tree, which should be the worst thing that you can do to put solar, uh, you have to save the big trees where possible. And, and they put, for example, 465 new large landscape trees for one mature canopy tree. We would need like 500 small trees to, in, in five years, at least start the producing a little bit of sequestering carbon. So the nonsense of it all would be to destroy a nature canopy already grown, forested with all the life that has on top, in the middle, underneath. We know of the rhizomes, we know all the life that is underneath. So um, cheer up for you, cheer up for life, <laughs> life in all senses that uh, uh, we need we need the basic elements to survive water the air the soil mm -hmm. and of course trees are the commanders in chief of all this and i beg you i beg i beg because i'm not the expert but i am for the environment more than 40 years and i've heard lots of many things i do have heard lots where only profit counts. Power for people doesn't count, but it's power only for profit company, and that's how the world is going. So I would like Scott to give his good advice to this committee, uh, talking about how solar affects or really our nature. And welcome, Scott, to be here. I'm sure you are here because of the wonderful forest and green areas that we are going to keep forever. Thank you very much. All right, great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Laura, for those for those comments. Okay, um, awesome. Seeing uh, no other hands from the uh, uh, from the attendees. Um, uh, let me bring the meeting to a close. Um, thank you, everybody for your um, good discussion today. Um, Martha for the minute taking. Um, I will reach out to the rest of the committee, ask them to listen to the recording and be prepared to um, dig into this uh, again on September 1st. <clears throat> and we'll also reach out to Stephanie with regard to um, making sure that we have a good attendance September 1st or look for another date. Um, and um, uh, and have a good um, good weekend. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Take bye, -bye, care. bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>